I was going to make a video about that uh, the school shooting down in Tennessee, but instead of making that video, I saw this and I just, I can't let it slide. Like, I can't, right? So, Aaron McIntyre did a video about 11 days ago proposing that there's a boogeyman. We called him Baba Yaga. The boogeyman? And... I'll be honest, I can't tolerate people who want to say that there's a boogeyman because there's just not. Let's get into the video and I will explain to you why the boogeyman is not what you think. The city of Philadelphia has announced an agreement to pay a $9.25 million settlement in connection with the police response to protests after the death of George Floyd in 2020. While dozens were killed and billions of dollars of damage were done during the riots that raged across America for weeks in the summer of 2020, it's the participants of those riots themselves who will be paid restitution by the government. Law and order in the United States has now descended to a level of anarcho-tyranny in which the government funds rioters with the tax money of their victims. Uh, I wish to point out that my next witness does not appear in support of either party. The court calls Richard Palms. Richard Palms to come forth and be heard. Richard Palms! Preston has told me that you were standing next to him just before the fatal moment. I was? So close, in fact, that your coat was scorched with musket fire. Did you have occasion to exchange words with the accused? I did. What did you say to him? I asked him if he had intention to order his men to fire on the crowd. And what did Captain Preston reply? He said, as he was standing in front of them, he would be foolish to do so. So you are prepared to swear he was standing in front of his men, not behind them, as Mr. Goddard told us. Palms. And when did you hear the command to fire? After the first shot went off. And did these words come from behind his men? I think they did. Could you swear? that Captain Preston did not shout that command. I could not. Very good, Mr. Palms. Captain Preston, you have heard the words of Richard Palms. Do you agree that you were standing not behind, but in front of your men? I do, sir. <laughs> It was while I was speaking with him, the first shot was fired, sir. Without your giving orders. Indeed, sir. If I may recall to the court the words of Richard Palms, I asked him, and when did you hear the command to fire? And he answered, after the first shot went off. Which man fired, Captain? Young Montgomery. Private Montgomery, sir. And what caused this man to fire, Captain? 
You received a severe blow with a club, sir. The... He fell to the ground and his musket discharged. After that happened, more clubs, bats. <laughs> I was telling them not to fire, sir. You were telling them to fire! But some voices were urging them to fire. Fire! 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 Shoot me if you dare. They were, sir. Where did these voices come from, Captain? From the alley behind my man, sir. Voices from a crowd saying, shouting, damn your blades! Why don't you fire? If I may recall for the court the evidence of Robert Gunner. I heard the voice of Captain Preston say, Damn your bloods! And then he gave the order to fire. What you just saw was a clip from uh, John Adams. It's a docuseries on Showtime, I think. It might be on HBO, but it's great. You have a, you have a chance to check it out. It's amazing. Um, but... Here's the reality. John Adams defended soldiers who shot into protests and got them acquitted, right, from the crown. At no point in American history has it been acceptable, right, for police to stand here and actually maintain law and order during a protest or a riot. That's why it is instilled into the U.S. Constitution, your right of assembly. Even during the 1970s riots at Kent State, where the protesters burnt down buildings. Sound familiar? They shot into a crowd and killed four people and then had to pay the protesters $675,000. All right? This is a normal thing. The world that Aaron McIntyre thinks of as being normal has never existed in the history of America. This is... The, this is we, you're living in a fantasy world that does not exist. Law and order has never been more important, all right, than the freedom of the people. Like, and I don't know whether that's a bad or a good thing. I'm not standing here saying I'm on the protester side. It's just, you have to understand that this is a false narrative. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> the slow death of the rule of law in America would be ugly enough. But what we're witnessing instead is the twisted, grimacing corpse of a system that was once designed to protect the safety of Americans, now being used to punish us for disagreeing with our political elites. I mean, look, this is um, the first actual, like, uh, what you would call Bill of Rights in America. It's called the Charter of Privileges in Pennsylvania. William Penn put it in in 1700. All right, this is... 85 years before we would get the United States Constitution. It's 89, I think. I think it was the Constitution was signed in 1789. Either way it goes, it doesn't matter. Listen, okay? It is highly important that you look through these documents and you find a place where it says, rule of law shall be maintained. Because that doesn't exist in any of these type of documents. Because it isn't about that. It's about the freedom of the people right and even in this right they have an entire they have an entire uh document they have an entire article right you know what i mean like one of the you know the, ar the ar char articles of the charter it says you know a, a criminal will be entitled to the same amount of information and ability as the prosecutor has right it protects the criminal over the government it even says if you decide to kill yourself because you don't feel like you want to keep living anymore, it in in the first Bill of Rights, if you kill yourself, your property shall, you know what I'm saying, go to your wife and children, not to the governor. You shall not answer to any governor or any lord or any magistrate other than an actual court. At what point did we start thinking Right, that literally the police should be Judge Dredd. At what point did you start thinking, start thinking that law and order is more important than the freedom of the people? The breakdown of law and order is common in nations that are in a general state of collapse. 
As the Constitution reminds us, the primary duties of a government include establishing justice and ensuring domestic tranquility. A nation that delivers neither will usually exhibit a wider range of systematic failures that would doom the larger civic project. America, however, is perfectly capable of collecting taxes, surveilling its citizens, and fighting a proxy war with a nuclear-armed opponent in order to maintain a global empire. The destruction of rule of law by our leadership class doesn't seem to be a product of general incompetence, but a specifically engineered outcome designed to terrorize the average citizen. Conservative commentator Samuel Francis coined the term anarcho-tyranny to describe a state that is still capable of performing most of its essential functions, but intentionally chooses to use selective enforcement of the justice system to punish law-abiding citizens while rewarding the criminal actions of its political supporters. The pandemic lockdowns and subsequent riots of 2020 put this phenomenon on full display. So, here's the thing. If you've ever read Edward Bernays or Ted Kaczynski, right, it, it explains this phenomenon really well. So I grabbed a couple of their clips here and I'm going to play them for you. Check this out. Chapter I. Organizing Chaos. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. Our invisible governors are, in many cases, unaware of the identity of their fellow members in the inner cabinet. The System's Neatest Trick by Theodore John Kaczynski The system has played a trick on today's would-be revolutionaries and rebels. The trick is so cute that if it had been consciously planned, one would have to admire it for its almost mathematical elegance. 1. What the system is not Let's begin by making clear what the system is not. The system is not George W. Bush and his advisors and appointees. It is not the cops who maltreat protesters. It is not the CEOs of the multinational corporations, and it is not the Frankensteins in their laboratories who criminally tinker with the genes of all living things. All of these people are servants of the system, but in themselves they do not constitute the system. In particular, the personal individual values, attitudes, beliefs, and behavior of any of these people may be significantly in conflict with the needs of the system. To illustrate with an example, the system requires a respect for property rights, yet CEOs, cops, scientists, and politicians sometimes steal. And speaking of stealing, we don't have to confine ourselves to actual lifting of physical objects. We can include all illegal means of acquiring property, such as cheating on income tax, accepting bribes, and any other form of gift or corruption. But the fact that CEOs, cops, scientists, and politicians sometimes steal does not mean that stealing is part of the system. On the contrary, when a cop or politician steals something, he is rebelling against the system's requirement for the respect of law and private property. Yet even when they are stealing, these people remain servants of the system as long as they publicly maintain their support for law and property. Whatever illegal acts may be committed by politicians, cops, or CEOs as individuals, theft, bribery, and graft are not part of the system, but diseases of the system. The less stealing there is, the better the system functions. And that is why servants and boasters of the system always advocate obedience to the law in public, even if they may sometimes find it convenient to break the law in private. Take another example. Although the police are the system's enforcers, police brutality is not part of the system. When the cops beat the crap out of a suspect, they are not doing the system's work. They are only letting out their own anger and hostility. The system's goal is not brutality or the expression of anger. As far as police work is concerned, the system's goal is to compel obedience to the rules and to do so with the least possible amount of disruption, violence, and bad publicity. Thus, from the system's point of view, the ideal cop is one who never gets angry, never uses more violence than necessary, and as far as possible relies on manipulation rather than force to keep people under control. Police brutality is only another disease of the system. Well, the way it works is something like this. 
In deciding what position to take on any issue, the editors, publishers, and owners of the media must consciously or unconsciously balance several factors. They must consider how their readers or viewers will react to what they print or broadcast about the issue. They must consider how their readers or viewers will react to what they print or broadcast about the issue. They must consider how their advertisers, their peers in the media, and other powerful persons will react. And they must consider the effect on the security of the system of what they print or broadcast. These practical considerations will usually outweigh whatever personal feelings they may have about the issue. The personal feelings of the media leaders and their advertisers and other powerful persons are varied. They may be liberal or conservative, religious or atheistic. The only universal common ground among the leaders is their commitment to the system, its security, and its power. Therefore, within the limits imposed by what the public is willing to accept, the political factor determining the attitudes propagated by the media is a rough consensus of opinion among the media leaders and the powerful people as to what is good for the system. Thus, when an editor or other media leader sets out to decide what attitude to take towards a movement or a cause, his first thought is whether the movement includes anything that is good or bad for the system. Maybe he tells himself that his decision is based on moral, philosophical, or religious grounds, but it is an observable fact that in practice the security of the system takes precedence over all other factors in determining the attitude of the media. You no, know, that was a lot of like, you know, I mean, information to put in. I know. All right, legit. Like, I, I understand that, like, yo, y'all are not interested in listening to long form stuff on this type of manner, but it's important we put in, like, actual, like, stuff. You know, when we're arguing, when we put in actual facts and, like, real documents and, like, the real shit. When we're arguing with these people, right? Because you have to state your case, right? Now, the whole point of stating this is, is that literally these people don't know each other, right? This is an, this is an oligarchy that is uh, decentralized in the end of the day, right? It's, it's literally like a group of people who don't know what, don't know each other and aren't really privy to each other, like conversating wise and things of this nature. Like you have, yes, the Bilderberg group and, you know, the WEF and UN, all these type of things, right? But the truth is, is that the vast majority of these people, the only reason they know what they know is because they go to college. Right. And when they go to college, they get indoctrinated into the same systems, into the same ideologies here. Check this out. My favorite clip from fucking Yarvin. It's like if you read anyone's college application essay, what is the most common thing that these people who are applying to college because they're applying literally you're on your college application, you were ranked. As, the Amer as a member of the American aristocracy, as surely as Peter the Great's table of ranks. Okay, you were applying, when you apply to college, you were applying for a rank. The fact that it's not official, there isn't like some like badge you get or anything like that, okay, sure, but you're applying for a rank. And what do you say when you're applying for, for a rank? Very simple, you wanna change the world. You wanna make an impact. Everyone basically, who aspires to matter in this country, in this world today, is someone who wants to make an impact. What you're saying when you say, I wanna make an impact, is literally you are saying, I want power. And because you are literally saying, I want power, and feeling powerful, even though there's no possible world in which millions of people can actually literally hold power, which means affect government decisions or affect government authority, they're saying, I wanna be powerful. And so, if you wanna be powerful, and there's basically all of this um, essentially pornography of power out there saying you can you know, feel powerful by supporting this. You can feel powerful by putting this sign in your yard. This, putting this sign in your yard reminds you that you matter, that you're trying to make a difference, that you realize how bad things are. Often you'll like think of the powers that be as completely imaginary corporate conspiracies or something like that. Um, and you'll basically be like, I'm making a difference, which your sign actually says, this sort of goes back to the kind of Machiavellian approach of seeing you know, the difference between sort of the objective and the subjective reality. What all of those signs really say, I'm cribbing from a famous uh, dissident essay from Václav Havel here, what they really all, all say is, I support power. I support the government. I support the parties in charge. Exactly. I am. I think, I think this every day as I <laughs> and, look and, around. And, you know, and it's just like it's like it's like the glasses and, and they live. You know. But I drive by and, and I see a Black Lives Matter 
sign in someone's driveway, what they're saying is, I'm obedient to the regime. Yeah. So, is this anarcho tyranny? No. This is the end result of a system that wants to have everybody possible in it, whether it be blacks or immigrants or women or men or whatever, pick your thing, right? They want all of these people inside of this system. And they want to be able to give them loans and put them in an office and put them in a cubicle and have everybody there to be able to work together and make money for them, right? And <clears throat> the way that the system does this is by promoting anti-racism, pro, what you guys would call woke ideology. And these things, these changes, these ideas, right, are a natural process of this system that's been going on since the 1800s. When it, whether it be the Civil War, whether it be, you know, uh, the civil rights issues, whether it be, you know, the, the, the feminism arguments of the 1900s and the suffragettes, right? All of these things are changes that the system needed to be able to include more people, to be more competitive, to lower wages, to expand itself. And this is not a purposeful thing. This is a natural phenomenon. There is no boogeyman. It doesn't exist. The truth is, is that everybody who argues on both sides, whether you're a person screaming law and order and hang the protesters, or whether you're a person going, yeah, fight the power, you know, George Floyd is my saint. Both sides are promoting a system that they don't know that they're promoting. You're giving, when you fight against the protests and you fight against George Floyd and you fight against racism, what you're doing is, is you're giving them a target. And you're giving them a, a reason to protest and creating a monster that doesn't exist. And that's important to understand. Yo, look, I'm Tom Pease of Pinoid News, man. We got new t-shirts on the Tee Public, man. Y'all go check them out. It's, it's hot fire. All right, get yourself a t-shirt. We got Grim, we got Floyd, you know what I'm saying? We got all three of us, Rambo up in the background, chasing the squirrel right on top of the on top of the roof. Um, Make sure you check out the cartoon this Saturday. Make sure you check out the cartoon from this week. Um, It's kind of disjointed, but, you know, we're, uh, we're working out some new things and trying to, like, do new animation processes, so... A lot of it is kind of like you're focusing on the animations. You know, it is what it is. Yo, look, man, I'm I'm Tom Pease of Pinoid News, all right? Do me a favor and drop a sub if you enjoyed this content. Um, I apologize. It's kind of heavy, you know I mean, brain bucket stuff today. But I, I got to, sometimes I got to do what I got to do. I'm up out of here. Peace.